Happy New Year, everybody. It is January 2021, and because it is the new year, I like to engage in a tradition, a New Year's tradition of mine, and that is I read through a very a specific chapter in Charles Spurgeon's famous book titled Lectures to My Students, and that chapter is titled The Necessity of Ministerial Progress. Yes, the necessity of ministerial progress. I got that right. Spurgeon opens the chapter with these words. Dear fellow soldiers, we are few and have a desperate fight before us. Therefore, it is needful that every man should be made the most of and nerved to his highest point of strength. In this chapter, Spurgeon goes on to discuss six areas that pastors should be cultivating in their personal lives. Hence the need, or hence the title, the need, the necessity of ministerial progress. And those six areas uh, are areas, by God's grace, that I try to improve on every year. I can't say that I'm always successful at it, uh, but at least I'm trying, and I hope that you will at least try also as a preacher, as a pastor, to improve in these six areas. And here they are. The first one that Spurgeon encourages us to make forward progress in is the area of mental acquirement. That is, that we should be growing in knowledge. As Spurgeon said, be well instructed in theology and do not regard the sneers of those who rail at it because they are ignorant of it. Many preachers are not theologians and hence the mistakes they make. By this, Spurgeon does not mean that we should be overly clever with the Bible and discover doctrines that God himself has not discovered, and to read into the white spaces of the Bible, as some preachers are so infamous for doing. That's not what Spurgeon means, but rather he's encouraging us to become masters of old truth. He warns us of those who claim to have found a diamond, but instead have discovered a piece of broken glass. That's not the kind of growing and mental acquirements that Spurgeon is encouraging. He warns us of getting to the point where we think we know everything and of no longer having that hunger for learning and acquiring more knowledge and understanding. When a preacher gets to the point that he thinks he has it all figured out, that is the moment at which his ministry begins to stagnate and his preaching will become about as exciting as a Christmas tree in January. So make progress, go forward in this area of mental acquirements. Secondly, he encourages us to improve in the area of oratorical qualifications. Be serious about becoming a better speaker. Cultivate a clear style. Our speech must be forceful, but not necessarily loud. As Spurgeon said so well, nonsense does not improve by being bellowed. So beware of thinking because you're louder than you were that you're a better preacher than you were. That's not necessarily true. And beware of developing a manufactured style of preaching. Some men, when they preach, they become almost caricatures of themselves. And that is something we want to avoid, this very robotic or manufactured or play-acting style of preaching. When you preach, be yourself. Be natural. Use a, a forceful voice, yes, but have a clear and distinct natural style of speaking when you preach. The third area which we need to cultivate is the area of moral qualities. Of all the leaders in the world, it is preachers who ought to be the most disciplined. No men should be more disciplined in their schedules, in their sleep routine, in their eating habits than the preacher. Now, I'm not advocating asceticism, and neither was Spurgeon advocating that kind of philosophy. But... He is encouraging us to be men of self-control and men of discipline. So along with that, put away from your mind notions of self-importance and kill self-indulgence 
Fight bigotry and bitterness in your heart and temper your speech and your internet comments with self-control. Spurgeon said, Resolve, dear brethren, that you can be poor, that you can be despised, that you can lose life itself, but that you cannot do a crooked thing. Fourthly, we must be advancing in the area of spiritual qualifications. Spurgeon said, This is the main matter. Other things are precious, but this is priceless. Know Jesus, he said. Sit at his feet. Consider his nature, his works, his suffering, his glory. Commune with him from day to day. To know Christ is to understand the most excellence of sciences. Being moral is one thing. Being spiritual is another. A man might be moral but not spiritual. But a man cannot be spiritual without being moral. And a preacher must have both. Fifthly, Spurgeon encourages us to go forward in actual work Some preachers spend their days frittering away their time by scrolling and tweeting and liking and all the nonsense and distractions that this modern information age affords us. Beware of those black holes of time and instead focus on doing actual gospel work. Don't waste your energy on ecclesiastical politics and chat rooms, and silly Facebook debates. But do actual work. Spurgeon said, while committees waste their time over resolutions, do something. While societies and unions are making constitutions, let us win souls. We fritter away those precious hours with busy work and easy living, And we'll find ourselves coming to a point in our lives where we wish we could regain all of that lost time. And that's impossible. So seize the day and accomplish actual work. And do more, accomplish more than you did last year. That doesn't mean being busier. It means actually accomplishing things. I think we can discern the difference. Lastly, Spurgeon encourages us to go forward in the matter of the choice of your sphere of action. And by this, Spurgeon means to make a plea for foreign missions. That is, he wants young men, as he discusses in the chapter, to consider, and even old men and middle-aged men, but he wants us to consider the need of the gospel in the area of foreign missions. And I know that probably most who will watch this video and most who have read Spurgeon's book are men who have settled ministries and they're probably uh, happy to be where they're at. And I understand that. But there are some men who know that they're not where they should be. And there's young men who are seeking to know where they should be. And in your seeking and praying, would you consider foreign missions? at least determined to go where the gospel is needed. I get the feeling that many approach church planting in the way that Starbucks approaches opening a new cafe. They look to go where the money is, where the demographics are promising, where the families are young. There's nothing wrong with those things in and of themselves, but that might not be the place where the gospel is needed the most. You might find yourself just uh, competing for church members instead of compelling the unbeliever with the gospel. And this is something to consider. And this is something that all pastors should remind themselves of. Are we truly reaching the lost? Are we where the gospel is needed? And if the gospel is needed here, are we getting the gospel out? So if you're new to the ministry, I challenge you to consider going where the gospel is needed most. You might not get a Pinterest-worthy building. 
you might not find yourself in the middle of a cool urban vibe, but if you're where the gospel is needed, then your life will have an impact on eternity and your ministry will matter. I close with Spurgeon's final words in this chapter. He says, forward, in God's name, forward. And to that I say, amen. Happy New Year, everybody.